Clarksville on such a rainy day. I, I know that uh, some school systems were closing early and that made it difficult for folks to be here, but I appreciate those of you who are able to make it. And we hope today's gonna be a productive day for you as we talk about Grow Your Own. Um, in order to get this thing started, I'd like to introduce our Assistant Commissioner for Human Capital, David Donaldson. Uh, thank you everybody. Um, on the ride here from the office, it actually made me think I was back in Michigan with the amount of potholes and the rain. I just, this state uh, continues to, uh, I feel like I'm warming more and more up uh, to live in here. Um, and also uh, be, have become instantly a lot more uh, empathetic to many of our coworkers commute. So I actually moved here from New York City. So I am now seven months in still do not have a car, so I get to walk to work, and to think that people commute this far uh, to serve the students of Tennessee to our, uh, at our department just um, puts a lot of things in perspective. And it also puts things in perspective, all the commute that you all had to come to this. We couldn't be more excited about the future of Grow Your Own in the state of Tennessee. Um, one of our strategic plan goals is that we become the best state to become and remain an educator. And frankly, I actually think we can become the first state where if you want to become a teacher, you can become one for free and get paid to do so. Um, with that said, I couldn't, uh, I, I, I know I sound like a broken record, but I continue to say how incredibly uh, impressed I am uh, by Clarksville Montgomery School District and their leadership. Um, Director House, thank you uh, for your lead and, and for hosting us here today, as well as the work uh, that they have done with uh, Austin P. Uh, and Dean Chandler, and also what they will be doing with uh, Lipscomb, which is incredibly exciting as well. And we look forward to having, the next time we host these summits, to saying what's going on in Hamilton County, what's going on in Knox, what's going on in Murfreesboro. I mean, there are some amazing leaders uh, here today from the districts that I've gotten to know, which, and frankly, they have uh, been very kind with their time and expertise in mentoring me. And now I look forward uh, to getting and building our relationships with the universities. Um, with that said, um, I'll actually be turning it over now to, to Dr. Chandler. Great, to uh, Dean Chandler uh, for, to kick us off. So thank you, everybody. Thanks. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I wanna thank all the folks that are on the agenda. Instead of calling everybody's name and missing somebody, um, I'm very fortunate to be the dean at Austin P. I've been the dean for two and a half years and we're doing some amazing work as, as uh, he mentioned, but it's due to the, the, the pre presenters today. Um, so we started this work about two years ago and that's one of the things I like to start with when I give this talk is I see two reactions from people in the, in the room when I give this talk. They nod, they smile, they're like, man, that sounds like a great idea. And then I have people who look at me like they can't believe that we're doing the things we say we're doing. But one of the things I like to highlight is that this isn't something that we decided we wanted to do like on Monday and then rolled this thing out on Tuesday, okay? A lot of this work goes back to the very first days of, of, of my time uh, as dean. And that brings us to uh, our, really our first slide which is sort of the mind shifts that had to take place for this work to sort of take off. I would also like to, to say that this is the, largely the result of the work that Susan Jones has, has done with the State Department. Uh, I came to the state in 2017, and this was one of the things that was being rolled out. I was told that some places really liked it and some places really didn't, um, but coming from other states where there was no structure when it came to EPP's relationships with school districts, and that is Alabama and Ohio. We were doing, yeah, we were doing partnership work with no guidance from the state at all. And so it was really hard to tell whether or not you were doing it right or whether you were doing the things you should be doing. There's really no sort of vision behind what partnerships should look like. And so when I started in the summer of 2017, that was something that as an, as an outsider coming in, um, completely latched onto and, and sort, of, sort of dug in and got to work. These are the shifts that we made in our college to sort of think about the way to do this work. Um, and again, when I, framed, when I framed this to our college, it was if we, could, if we could sort of wipe the slate clean and start all over, if we could do this in a completely new way, how would it look? 
And we came to the conclusion pretty early that if we were to wipe it clean and start over and try to do it in a different way, it wouldn't look how we were currently doing it. By the way, you could apply that same logic to a lot of things we do in universities. That if you could start all over and, and do it in a different way, it wouldn't look how we're currently doing it. And so our shifts were looking at um, the preparation of teachers as a joint effort between uh, EPPs and school districts. Uh, we are really fortunate to be right next door to, to CMCSS. Uh, and the way I frame this is we have talent in the, in the college, they have talent in the schools, we're doing good things, they're doing good things, but the history of our College of Education was that we sort of did our own thing and they did theirs. And so the shift of us looking at this job of preparing really good teachers as something we do as opposed to something uh, they do or, or, or just us. Looking at the, um, the partnership rules as an opportunity to do things better, and again, I sort of jokingly said that some people viewed this negatively while some people latched onto it. Some folks viewed the new partnership rules as sort of another, one more thing to do, one more compliance issue. And again, coming from the outside uh, in, I looked at this and said, look, I tried to view this as an opportunity to do things better. And again, if you've forgotten why I'm going into this big spiel, it's to talk about how this took a couple of years to get to the point to where we are. Um, one of the first conversations we had with, with the district was talking about our interests. And a lot of times when you have partnership uh, conversations and you're working with the school districts, I think we sometimes forget that by and large the things that we want in the school, College of Education and the things that the school district want pretty much overlap. They're kind of the same thing. Now we may go at it in a different way and call it a different thing, but at the end of the day we're sort of wanting the same thing. Um, another paradigm shift that we had in the college was talking about the things that we are capable of doing and things we are not capable of doing. I know that in my past jobs we would get together with the school district and talk about what, what work we could do together and there wasn't enough honesty in the conversation to talk about the things people were willing to do or not willing to do. And so it, it's worth having the conversation with your EPP or if you're the school district vice versa talking about what it is you can and can't do right up front. Because when you don't talk about what you can and can do right up front, you come across as being, as being difficult when it really is uh, just a, a sort of a reality check. And again, we talked about the, the starting from scratch. Uh, another shift that leads into this, this slide is something I like to call uh, big P, little p. Uh, my faculty are tired of hearing, the people that work with me closely are probably tired of hearing me talk about this, but this is how I think about it. That in the past, what we do when we do partnership work is very transactional. Uh, it's you do something for me, I do something for you. The classic example of this is when we call uh, the school district or they call us for a special ed teacher or a math teacher, right? Do you have a teacher to fill this slot? Or do you have uh, places for our student teachers? Or do you have places for us to do to do uh, clinical uh, field experiences. Of course, that's an uh, inherent part of what we do, so I'm not suggesting we get rid of that. Uh, but I am saying that that, in my experience, is the sort of end point of a lot of partnership work. That it's, it's a couple of phone calls, it's a couple of placements, it's a couple of folks that need a math teacher or a SPED teacher. That's small p, very transactional, very reactive. Big P partnership is sort of what today is, is about. Uh, Big P partnership gets at what I think of as sort of persistent structural problems in education. Um, again, not saying we shouldn't do little p, but this, this the, the, what the state has done with uh, partnership agreements and what CMCSS and Austin P are doing, uh, it represents a shift towards that small p to the big P. Um, persistent problems in education, things like t uh, uh, pipeline issues, diversity in the workforce, uh, high needs uh, licensure areas. And, and when, if you look back through the literature over the decades, we're really good at complaining about the same thing year after year after year. And the EPP tries to solve it, and then the state tries to solve it, and the district tries to solve it. And this, this project represents sort of a, a, a combination of all three of those uh, trying to get at this problem uh, together. At Austin P, we had to overcome some history with, with the district. Uh, you know. Uh, and this is, again, not uncommon. And when I was in Ohio, Alabama and Ohio, um, relationships between universities and districts can get stale over time. They can. Um, 
And so that was a part of what we did. The other, <clears throat> these other two go together, is one of the first things that we did uh, back in 17, 2017, was uh, got our leadership team with the school district's leadership team and did a SWOT analysis. And so if you're thinking about doing any of this sort of work uh, in tandem with, with if you're, again, if you're a school district with your EPP or EPP with a school district, this is one of the first conversations that you need to have. I think there's a worksheet on the table that gets at some of this. Um, but it's a very honest conversation about what each side needs and what each side can actually provide. Um, and again, I, this goes without saying, but we put it up here anyway, is that all of what I'm describing, all of what we'll talk about today, um, happens because we trust the other side and they trust us. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the most telling meetings that we had in this two and a half years of work was when we showed the district our data and they showed us theirs. It was like the first time in the history of man that it ever happened. Um, but it was, again, it was sort of silly that we weren't sharing information. And then we took it up a notch and we invited the state to come help us. Can you imagine that? Like, and, uh, where, where the EPP and the school district and the state invited one another to collaborate on, a, again, I, that's not something that happens in other places that I've been. Um, I'll say this and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Barron. Uh, this project also represents something I've never seen before, which is uh, a collaboration between the State Department and I've, I'll, I'll, when we give this talk, I always say this, is that the State Department doesn't get enough credit for the good things that they do. Deans of Education are sort of notorious for criticizing the State Department. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is a really good thing that they're doing with partnerships, as again, coming from someplace where they didn't have anything. But the state, the colleges of ed, school districts, teacher association, and school boards all working together on, on this project. And so uh, if you don't remember anything I said on my two slides, remember <laughs> that this is the result of a couple of years of work. Um, I think when people hear our talk, they have really two concerns. One is, mo one is money, which we'll talk about in a little while, funding. Um, but they talk about how long does this take? And so if you are, if your part, it really depends on where you are on the scale, the sort of sliding scale of partnership. If you already have a, an existing partnership that's really, really strong, you're going to be able to do some of this stuff a little quicker. If you're one of those groups whose partnership sort of relationship has grown stale over the years, this might take a little longer than, than we make it out because, again, this is the result of uh, over two years of work. All right. I have a note here that says lots of work. So. Um, <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Barron. Dr. Barron is the uh, Director of Teacher Education and Partnerships at Austin P. Thanks. Um, so what I'm going to describe in the next few slides, um, many of you could stand up here and say the same thing for your work with your primary partners or with your uh, state recognized partners. So what I'm going to say is not probably earth shaking. You can probably say we have that at our, own, at our EPP. We do that with our school districts. But um, again, to reiterate what Dr. Chandler has said, um, we just want to establish that there was um, a lot of work that went into the primary building the foundation. So the, one of the things that we did, uh, Dr. Chandler mentioned doing a SWOT analysis, we realized we had the same priorities. And the things that came to the top pretty quickly was uh, the need for us to recruit more diverse candidates into our program. And the district had a need to also recruit more diverse teachers in their district. In addition to that, we were trying to build our enrollment. Um, um, Dr. Imperatris will go uh, talk about this in a minute, how the declining enrollment in teacher ed has impacted uh, college's education. But also the trickle down effect of that obviously is it's impacted the school districts. And so how could we get at this need to bring more teachers into our, or more uh, candidates into our program, uh, which would result in more um, teachers, of course, for the district. So that was a primary thing that we were back and forth talking a lot about. Um, we knew that partnerships were more than just something we talk about once a month at their partnership meeting when it began to drive the work that we do in our university. And I can't emphasize that point enough. We would be making decisions, doing plans, thinking about long range strategies. And in every single meeting, we would say, how will this impact our partnerships? What would the partners think about this? 
Maybe we should run this by, by the partners to the point that the, the partners became like a, you know, a big bad law firm or something we were trying to uh, appease. And it really wasn't that enough at all. It was just that we were trying to involve them in the work so much that they were part of our decision making in, in our college um, so that everything became just woven with partnership work, if that makes sense. Um, so it really did begin to drive our work. And one of the things that probably, um, from my perspective, was the most outward um, evidence of our partnership relationship is that from my office comes the uh, request for field placements and for clinical teaching placements, which is a huge job. It's also um, a nightmare to deal with every, and if you are in that job or if you have had uh, work with that, you know it's, it's a struggle every single semester to get placements. And we talked to CMCSS in particular about this, and they just said, then give it to us. And we were like, what? And, and so literally, I, like I gave them our placement request, and they filled it. So it wasn't me going back and forth to the principals, uh, do you have anybody, anybody can, you know, I'll, it gets to, you have a living, breathing human who will take a, you know, a student teacher. It, it, it went from that to, do you have a level four or five teacher who would be an excellent role model for this student teacher? And it goes through their um, level directors and it goes through their chief academic officer so that it's given the, the level of importance it needs so that our student teachers can have the best uh, placements that they can have so they have a good experience and then in turn want to continue in the profession. So it helped us tremendously, but it also of course helps all the districts, not just CMCSS, but Dixon and Cheatham and Robertson and Stewart and Sumner, all of our partners that we deal with. But that's been probably the most obvious uh, evidence for me in uh, this partnership work. We also, um, we talked a lot about our primary partnership, of course, is with CMCSS, and that's where we have this residency program. But we've also, a want, we don't want to discount our other partners who are more rural than, than CMCSS. And so we've also started other initiatives with them, the Rural Ed Initiative and other things so that we can make them feel included and as, as important as obviously they are to the work. So when you're planning this, if you're doing a residency program, you might wanna think about, yes, this is a, a lot of work going into that but you don't want an unintended consequence of that work being that you drop off the work with other partners. So that's something that we have to have continually re uh, remind ourselves that all of our partners are a value. We want them all to have our student teachers in their districts. We want our student teachers to feel at home in their districts as well. Um, and again, I'm gonna describe something that you probably already have at your EPP or perhaps if you're from a school district you were involved in and that's the Partnership Advisory Council. That's the group that we meet um, twice a semester with, and it really comes to the nitty gritty decisions, our plans, uh, strategic moves. That's where we talk about needs, where we talk about how, how we can improve. We talk to them about um, things that are going on in our college. We get input from them. It's, um, honestly, it's been a, a very um, excellent, uh, group for us to convene every time because they are all in. They're all in and helping us be the best we can be because they realize that our passion is also to work with them. All right, I see some familiar faces in the room and if you're wondering if this is gonna be the exact same presentation you've already seen, it's not. Our goal today is for you to be sitting around people you can work with and think through. If you're interested in pursuing a Grow Your Own initiative, we wanted to put you around people who could push your thinking and maybe uh, if there were enough school districts in the room, somebody that you could actually start planning some next steps with. So I'm gonna introduce a familiar face, uh, Dr. Susan Jones. I think all of you have worked with her in some capacity or another. Uh, she's done a fabulous job of, of adjusting an instrument that she uses to uh, critique partnerships and she's gonna take you through the first couple sections. Well, good afternoon. It's nice to see so many familiar faces in the room. It's also nice to be back at my old stomping grounds um, and this beautiful facility. When I left here, it was 
um, a warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> it was in progress to become a professional development center and um, just it was something we looked forward to and I'm very happy to be with you here in this room today. So as um, Dr. Mason um, mentioned, you should have a form or a, a worksheet um, in a, with a pretty blue color on it. This may look very familiar to some of you who have already done um, the primary partnership inventory because these questions are derived from that tool. But what Josh and I have done is we've kind of repurposed the primary partnership inventory to let this tool now become a conversation starter about getting ready for growing your own partnerships. So the first section, um, it, it basically says on a scale of one to five, with one being low and five being high, to uh, collaboratively determine your partnership's potential for success um, based on the, the uh, items that are listed in the, in the uh, form. The first one having to do with vision and mutual goals. What we would like for you to do is um, if you're sitting with your potential partner, or a, a potential partner for Grow Your Own, or maybe two or three potential partners for Grow Your Own, talk about these items. Rate, that, rate them if you can, but more so talk about what you would need to do in preparing for your partnership, taking into consideration what you heard um, Dr. Chandler and Dr. Barron talk about for preparation for partnerships and just have a conversation at your table uh, regarding the items on here. There are some guiding questions to the side, so really this is to start conversations about getting ready, how prepared might you be for holding uh, or for looking at a Grow Your Own initiative. So we would like you to start with the blue section and then move on to the next section. We've got about 15 minutes, I think, to do this. So the first, first section, the blue section, is preparing for partnerships. And then the orange section is working on partnerships. So any questions about what we're asking you to do? Take notes on this, this form. It's yours to keep. Make notes about possibly what you might need to do, who you might need to talk to, follow-ups that you may need. Before this might be a little bit of repeat, but it'd be a good refresher of, on why this program developed. So I'm going to introduce the Chief Academic Officer for Clarks from Montgomery County Schools, Dr. Sean Imperatrice. Thank you, Dr. Mason. So I pick up where Dr. Chandler and Dr. Barron left off. We did share data with each other, and we had had a three-year strategic goal to increase our diversity of our teaching staff. Um, as you'll see in some upcoming slides, we have a real mismatch between our students' ethnicity and our teachers. And this work really was grounded in a diversity innovation planning grant that we got three years ago that was just a $20,000 grant from the state to say, okay, if, if you could look at best practice and research around increasing diversity, what would it look like? And at that time, uh, Dr. Phyllis Casebolt, there in the back way, Dr. Phyllis Casebolt was in human resources, did a lot of this research. But when we started meeting with Austin P, we realized we had a common goal. When we looked at their data, the area that they were lowest in their data, now they had exemplary data and growth of, of their teachers, wonderful data throughout their report card, the one area that they were the lowest was increasing diversity to their teaching candidates. The one area we had been working on is increasing diversity for our teaching candidates. So being in the same community, this isn't gonna happen at Austin P unless we help them, right? And so that's, that's a, that was a challenge. So this is just a snapshot of Clarksville, Montgomery County. If you've been in presentations, I won't go into a lot of this. Basically the biggest numbers there is our growth, 30 year average is 600. Um, the last three of the last four years we've grown by 1200. 40% um, of our schools achieving reward status, which we wanna to continue to improve, but was the highest in the state at the time of any schools 15 or more. But at the same time, we were 30 teachers short and we were still facing 
a situation where only 16% of our teachers were ethnically diverse. So when you look at our teaching body being 16% ethnically diverse and our students being 50%, I think we can all agree that students deserve an opportunity to learn from teachers that look like them. And that provides them opportunity. It provides them a pathway to greater success, an example of what success looks like. And so we were working on that work, but we could not ignore the shortage that was about to happen, or was happening to us for the first time, 30 teachers short. So this national trend data kind of tells a story. So in 1975, 22% of college freshmen declared education as their major. It was the number one major in 1975. And you can see 40 years later, it's down to 10%, and then two years later, down to 4.6%. At the same time, I'm the last year of the baby boomers, 1964. So in about 10 years, maybe I'll retire, maybe five years, but that's where we're at. At the same time, the shortage is happening, the confluence of the baby boomer, the biggest generation of teachers, are retiring. So when you put those together, then we're, we're facing a tidal wave about to hit us. So we're talking about this right now, but it's already hitting us. And no, have we been innovative? Yes, we've been innovative, but we probably won't see the results of that innovation until about three years from now. We're gonna get hit. And we're going to get hit hard. And we're not the only ones in this room that are going to get hit. So not doing anything or continuing to do things the way we've always done it, it's just not the answer. The solution is not in traditional teacher education, although we do need traditional teacher education. We need solutions beyond that. And so you can see that the numbers enrolled throughout the state in preparation programs within a year dipped by 1,500. That mirrors the national data. So what we started with two years ago, our first partner, Dr. Randall Lahan. Dr. Lahan, can you raise your hand, please? With Nashville Teacher Residency, as part of that research, we researched residency programs in Nashville Teacher Residency. And so we started with ELA and math in middle schools, three of our middle schools. And we had some 12 candidates that are teaching their first year after that residency program. So they, we did not have to spend a position on them because we already had inclusion. They had three periods where they, where they co-taught, one period where they co-planned, and then they were used as special ed EAs throughout the building any way um, the IEPs deemed necessary. This year, um, so, so what some of this research told us was the biggest research around pipelines was from Fresno State, Fresno Unified, Fresno Pacific. And basically there's two categories of people that you try to build pipelines with. You're classified and your high school seniors. Okay, that's reinvesting in your community. Your classified have degreed and non-degreed. So we started with our classified degree with National Teacher Residency in our middle schools and those 12 that are teaching today are not like first year teachers. They've hit the ground running. They went through a year with an exemplary teacher being a mentor, and they don't face what usual first year teachers face. They're confident, they have their own classrooms, they know what to do, they had already planned with them, they've taught, they've gotten a year worth of experience. Now they get paid during that year, as an educational assistant. So then we wanted to expand to the non-degreed area. So we started our early learning teacher residence and that's where we partnered with Austin P. And so these are non-degreed classified and high school seniors that met the HOPE scholarship. And they're on a three-year accelerated degree pathway. They don't take more than two classes at a time. They're eight-week uh, sub-semesters, two eight-week um, two courses every eight weeks for a total of 16 weeks, four courses as far as the semester goes. Um, and there's 20 high school seniors and 20 classified. They're in our five lowest socioeconomic schools and they're making a difference. So they learn from the exemplary teacher, which we'll tell you more about, um, every day and then they take their college classes in the early evening. So 
that's our, those are 2019, 2020, those are our pipelines. I just described them. We put about a million dollars of our general purpose budget into those pipelines. Largely, it was the educational assistance. Now, I told you with NTR, we didn't have to pay for educational assistance. But with the ELTR, we were trying to put more support in our five lowest socioeconomic schools and, and give K-2 an opportunity to have that support foundational. Um, in my 24 years in Tennessee, probably the biggest standard change I've seen is the early learning standards. And so we wanted to scale that work around early learning. They're getting a K-5 certification, a special ed certification, and most of that money was in educational assistance. They averaged just about $26,000 per ed assistant. So we flooded five schools with 20 educational assistants to provide extra support. And at the same time, there would be residents. And over three years, they would learn from master teachers. And in the fourth year, they would become a teacher, hopefully in, that same, in those same five schools that had difficulty attracting quality teachers. So for 2020-21, one of the reasons we're presenting on November 6th and today is because because um, we, we talked to uh, David Donaldson and we talked to the commissioner about we think we know how to do this with existing money so that you can scale this not only with a small district or a large district, but you can scale it for us also. Okay, and so it was around the class size waiver, and we can answer more questions on that as time goes on. But basically, it gives you a chance to go over the average, class size average, not past the maximum. And any teacher you save doing that, you reinvest into your pipeline work. So one teacher, you can buy two assistants, you can pay for their tuition, you can pay for their wraparound support, their practice tests, that kind of situation. So with that being said, next year, our goal is to double our NTR residents in, e in ELA math and they've added science in middle and high school. We started with high school this year. We have one candidate. And then we're starting another um, pipeline with Austin P called the EMTR, Early Middle Teacher Residents. And then Lipscomb is gonna give us a one-year degree program for elementary. So this is what this looks like. So remember I talked to you about Fresno State having a degreed and non-degreed pathway? Here are your degreed pathways. Lipscomb Teacher Resident, which is a K-5 special ed certification with a master's opportunity. Nashville Teacher Resident, which is an ELA math, science, one year middle school, high school with a master's opportunity. ELTR, which we described were the 20 and 20 um, in the early learning areas, 20 classified, 20 certified. Then EMTR, which is elementary middle teacher residents, which would be 10 more elementary, non-degree, three-year candidates in another five elementary schools. And then we hit our middle schools with a non-degree option. So we're gonna have 30 opportunities for them to be dual certified in either math or science with special ed as a dual certification. So when this all rolls out, we've got one year, so we'll have close to 40 something rolling out here a year if we meet our goals, every year. Dual certified here, um, ELA, math, science, middle school, high school. And then in the three year rollout, when it all matures, we'd have about 85 teachers going into classrooms every year, most of them dual certified. We're gonna come back to the financial piece in just a few minutes, but we do wanna take some time and give you time to talk at your tables again. Um, and I want you to ask yourselves, what problem am I, am I trying to solve? Maybe it's not a diversity problem in your district. Maybe you're trying to solve another problem, but if you are working at a table with people you might work with in the future, let's ask the question, are we trying to solve some of the same problems? As you heard Clarksville and Austin PE talk earlier, this all started 
around a diversity innovation grant, trying to figure out how to improve diversity at all, in Austin Peay's student ranks and how to improve workforce diversity here in Clarksville. So we'll give you a few minutes to think through that. There's also the orange section. If you'll flip to the second page, um, the orange section is the next section to start thinking through with your partners. As you heard Dr. Imperatrice talk, um, they realized they were struggling to recruit teaching candidates and they were going all over the country to find teaching candidates. And what they realized, if they were to think differently, there were a number of potential candidates sitting right here in this community that were an untapped resource. So a good person to help them with that problem was Dr. Randall Lahan, the Executive Director of the Nashville Teacher Residency. And he's going to talk to you a little bit about how to think about recruiting from your own community. That beast? <coughs> yeah. Thanks, man. Hi, everyone. It's, uh, it's really great to be here uh, and see so many familiar faces out here. And uh, really honored to have a chance to tell you a little bit about our program and, and most importantly, or specifically, uh, the last year or so, because uh, the last year or so is when we got our chance to really go after a Grow Your Own model. And our, our first generation of Grow Your Own graduates graduated last May. They're in, t in schools right now, and it's, uh, it's really exciting to see them out there. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about, about that story. We always, in, in NTR, think about our work as fundamentally serving two populations. On one hand, there are all the K-12 students who we haven't met yet that our teachers are gonna go out there and teach and hopefully make a difference with. But at the same time, we're also serving the population of teacher candidates themselves. And for, for many of them, teaching is, is the chance to, to change the, the course of, of their life, um, especially whenever we're talking about a grow your own model. It's something that I've, I've believed for a long time and now thanks to some really great partnerships we're seeing it, there are amazing people out there in our school system right now just waiting for that chance to, uh, to, to live their dream of being a teacher. But it can't just happen overnight. It can't just happen with a snap of the fingers. It takes some, some real structural and programmatic changes to be able to do it. And we're fortunate enough to have had a lot of people in this room that have helped do that. And that's Sean and his entire team at CMCSS. It's our friends in Metro Nashville this year. It's also Austin P, which has served as, as a graduate school partner for them. I'll talk about them more in a little bit, as well as Lipscomb University, who served as the graduate school partner for our Nashville graduates. So that, that work, it can, be, it can be done, but it really requires thinking, thinking critically about all the aspects of a system that are incredibly racialized as well, that have held people back from becoming uh, the teacher that they wanted to be. And up here, we have, have pictures of, of, our, of our residents that, that mean an awful lot to me. Uh, that's Janisha on the far left, who was our resident of the year last year. Uh, that middle crew, that's our Christmas party a year ago. 60% of our residents last year had kids. And the chance to move from a classified salary of 17000 to a teacher salary of 43000 that's life-changing, right? Like, literally life-changing for for those residents and, and their kids. But that final picture on, our, on, on the, the right, that's also our reminder that we have to be doing this in a way that is very compassionate and strategic. Um, that is graduation from Lipscomb University. Deborah, I don't know if you remember any of those people, Vanessa and Vanessa. Uh, and the, fir the first five on the left all became certified, and the, the last one on the right didn't. And that wasn't from lack of her effort. It wasn't from lack of effort for us. We were just too far away. And we, we were too far away and we took a year of her life that was very special and like important to us and we had a great time with her and she made some real relationships. But she's out of the profession now. And so while Grow Your Own can be incredibly exciting, it's also something that has to be done, I think, responsibly so that we don't get people's hopes up for a career that they might not be ready for. Or if they are ready for, maybe it's a three-year plan or a four-year plan, not a, not a one-year plan. So here's a quick look at our, our Grow Your Own model. We're gonna talk through the selection, the residency year, partnerships and then the results. I, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm guessing this is a familiar story for a lot of BPPs in the room, but trying to figure out who's gonna be a good teacher is just the hardest thing in the world. I've been trying to do it for 15 years. I've tried every 
statistical model on resumes and experiences and GPAs and interview ratings and everything else. And it is just so inherently noisy trying to figure out who's going to be a big a good teacher, who's even going to persist, or who might just decide middle of their junior year, you know what, I don't think I want to be a teacher after all. Thank you for the memories, right? And then they're, they're on to another major. The advantage of recruiting we found in the Grow Your Own model is that they're people who know exactly what teaching is about. There are no surprises to them on what teaching is about. And if you can get that strong principal recommendation, that is the most important data point to me and to our team than anything else, right? If you get a, re a recommendation from somebody who has been on the front lines of education with them for a year, two years, three years sometimes, if that person says they're ready to be a teacher, that's a more important data point than any interview that you can construct, no matter, no matter how strategic. And so we believe a ton in getting that strong principal recommendation. Below in that, that next bullet point, you can see what, uh, what that looks like before they enter the program. This is just to make sure that it's a good idea and that we have the right people. And we're in incredibly grateful to the state uh, for having a GPA waiver uh, appeals process in place. Um, because there are a lot of people who are super smart, super hardworking, and then life got in the way when they were in college. And the fact that they graduated at all, given that they had a kid and were working two jobs while trying to put themselves through school, should just add an extra 1.5 points to their GPA if we were going to be doing it fairly, but we can't, right? And so being able to use the GPA appeals process to make sure that the can there are candidates out there who deserve this, this chance and then give that to them, that, that means an awful, awful lot to us. And so we're uh, grateful the state gives it to us. That spring internship is in incredibly informative for us in making sure that not only do we know the candidates really well, but that they know teaching really well. Uh, because if they know teaching really well, then they're likely to do it for a very long time. If we know them really well, we can be sure we have the right people. Quick look at our, our residency year. Sean's referred to it a couple times, but to me, uh, one of the most important things is that residents exist as paid paraprofessionals or some other form of classified staff within uh, a school system. Um, the big ding on residencies for years, and Mark, I know you know this, right? They're great, but they're super expensive, right? And if we can recapture money that's already existing in the system, to pay for the next generation of teachers at the same time, we think that's, that's a win-win. And that is not, as I say this as a former special ed teacher, I, this is, that is not coming at the expense of students with special needs at all. It's that a resident serving in a paraprofessional position in the class of a really exceptional mentor teacher can serve those students with special needs while still learning from their mentor and then has switched places as the year goes on. So those kids are not, even, not just getting the same services, they're getting improved services because that paraprofessional has increasing skill and capacity thanks to all the work they're doing to become a teacher. And it also means that that position is permanent. We, uh, we often have conversations about grant-funded NTR positions, and I get terrified by every one of those because a grant-funded position is only as good as the length of that grant, and then we're scrambling trying to find another way to be at that school. If we can do it in a permanent way that takes care of kids, that's, that's what we want to do. A couple other notes in there, the deferred tuition, paying for the Praxis, paying for the EdTPA. We found that those are the moves that we need to do in order to be able to recruit the diverse candidates from the community. That the reason that they aren't already teachers themselves is because there are a lot of barriers in place and maybe the biggest one is financial. The number of single moms we had that are amazing teachers right now, it's significant, but they weren't about to take out more debt they're trying to keep the lights on, take care of their two kids. They needed something that allowed them to pursue their dreams, but also do it in a really uh, steady and, and safe way. And finally, here's our, our partnership slide. Uh, no, uh, no program can, can do this alone. So we've been really fortunate to have two great LEA partners in CMCSS and MNPS, grad school partners in APSU and Lipscomb as well as community partners. And those community partners help us identify people who are out there who are ready for, for their next career. They also support for us, they push us to do a better job of understanding the issues that our candidates are up against and support them in a way that we should. Personally, I, I love having the graduate school partnership. 
um, because it's a way of also knowing how our people do after they're done with their time with us. So Dr. Garcia over there and I have been on the phone what, half a dozen times in the fall, right, talking about a couple of our candidates that have moved on to Lipscomb and being able to, to have that connection, uh, it, that, that wraparound services, I know Keisha would no longer be in the program, would no longer be at Lipscomb, would no longer be in education if it weren't for the fact that we've got that sort of consistent line of care all the way through. That is not how you spell experiences. All right, here's our, our, some of the, the results from our first year of Grow Your Own. Uh, that big guy in the middle picture in Christmas on the, on the right is our text message chain with him. He failed the practice three different times uh, until the one time he didn't. And that, was, uh, that was in August, and you can see the chain reaction of joy that just sent off in, in our team. That's our team's text thread right there. Because he passed, and he made it through. And uh, I, have, I have very complicated and strong feelings about the praxis, and so don't, don't take this as a ringing endorsement. And what he did in passing it was not, not because we cracked some code, it's because he was so persistent and he took advantage of the resources available for him. And it has been, been my experience and that of my teams that you find a higher level of persistence with the Grow Your Own model than you do with traditional recruiting. Because this job is exactly what they've always wanted and they're willing to do anything to get it. And so he went back again and again and again, hundreds of hours of, uh, of prep before he passed it. And th that result, that's very much tied to the Grow Your Own model because this is what he always wanted to do. Um, I think the Praxis number is, is really interesting that there was 9% who would have passed it before NTR, moved up to 100. We think that number's gonna drop a little bit this second year, but it also shows that there are people out there that with, with a little bit of help can, can do this. So I think uh, my, the whole reason we wanna be here today and talk about our story is just uh, as, as a way of, like, of, of hopefully learning from other Grow Your Own models that are out there. I still think we're, fi we're flying blind an awful lot and fumbling around, particularly whenever it comes to figuring out how we remediate some of the content deficits that we see out there. And we're hoping that more Grow Your Own programs pop up so we can be pushed by a community of peers and try to figure out how to do this work a little bit better all together. Thank you, Randall. As I've come around the room, uh, we've had several questions about how did you do this and how did you do that? We hope this is gonna be an opportunity to answer some of those questions. If not, we do have a question and answer section directly following this. So I'm gonna invite up uh, Dr. Benita Brewster, who's gonna talk to you a little bit about how the university overcame some challenges on their end. Good afternoon. Lots of challenges. I've been sitting at that back table checking grades. Grades are due today. So I'm watching them tick through and we had about 750 non-reported grades and I'm looking for all of our 40 names. And we still have a couple we're checking on. So there's a lot of challenges. Once you get the students in the program and you get the program going, but we have had tremendous support and partnerships with our districts. And myself and Phyllis Casebolt sitting back there, we jointly know each other as joint moms. So it's like taking on a bunch of children because we talk almost every day and talk through the challenges of our students and thinking about where we are with this group of 40. Um, advising, we started thinking about advising the students way back in like April and May and uh, we started doing one at a time and finally I called the registrar's office and I said, we need to get them all in here together. So we found a date and we brought them all in and we had them all, all 40 of them in a room and we did the advising all together and what I learned quickly that I didn't know is that they're all at many different places. You might think, well, they're all freshmen, but guess what? They're not all freshmen. We've got probably about 15 of them with multiple hours that just shows you how bad they want to be a teacher because they've tried many, many times with transcripts coming from everywhere. Woo! Uh-oh. Transcripts coming from everywhere. And you would think, um, why haven't you given up by now? These are some of the non-traditional students who have, thank you, 
who have just persisted through all of those life's challenges. And so then looking at the courses that they've had and looking at the credits and what can we give them credit for, um, all of those course substitutions, we're still making those as they go through semester by semester. And they are taking four classes during a normal semester, two in each eight weeks. This is the first time out on these schedules and we're learning something every day with how the classes are scheduled and what needs to be more face-to-face -face and not online. They're all scheduled as a hybrid. We did that because there's different fees attached to classes based on if it's online or face-to-face -face or hybrid. So our recommendation right now is if you're thinking of doing this, hybrid is the best choice, at least for our fee structure at Austin P to keep the price of things down. But then is it the best way that all of these classes should be scheduled? They've just made it through biology, which was a beast to do a biology lab online. So that's just one example of rethinking how these classes are scheduled and what kind of format. Uh, and then tracking the students every single time to know how many passed, how many didn't. Right now we're doing really, really well, you know, but we lost a couple in the spring and then we quickly, I had one and Sean had one and we slipped two new students in there so that we could keep our 40 going. And so it's, it's a true partnership to keep them in the courses and keep them moving along and to track them to make sure everybody's where they need to be. And then the financial challenges was just another hurdle uh, because as our students started to look at, they're not having to pay for anything, but getting them coded in a special way so that the university knows that everything's paid for and taken care of because they have to confirm their classes once they've registered. And so the minute they confirm, they get you owe a bill and then they freak out and then, and then they call, you know, they really don't know anything, but we've got to get that straightened out with the financial aid office. And we've got many, many different kinds of students. The non-traditional students, we've got some who are veterans who have VA benefits. And we've got some who are uh, non-traditional returning and some with the Hope Scholarship and some with the Promise. And so they're all different kinds of financial challenges. And so initially, uh, we all met with the financial aid office and the registrar's office. And I've got a meeting tomorrow with the registrar's office. So it's a continual just um, support of these students and knowing what each one needs and, and understanding their unique individual needs so that we can make sure that they're successful. So those are some of the university challenges and I know that Sean's gonna talk about some of the school district, district challenges. Thank you, Dr. Brewster. I call Dr. Brewster my best friend because she helps us. Um, make sure that our students are getting a quality university education. But she took all of them on to be their advisor. So she, uh, many, many sleepless nights, um, she cares about them uh, the same way we care about them. So that, that's a true partnership. So one of the biggest challenges is in messaging. So you really have to, to make sure that, that the messaging of Grow Your Own is clearly understood top to bottom. So obviously you gotta have your board um, in the loop and understanding what we're trying to do. The teacher association, let me tell you a story. It's very unique. So two years ago, uh, the, the uh, CMCEA president wanted to meet with me and it's the year we were 30 short. And she said, what are you gonna do about the teacher shortage? And so we, these were all just plans except for NTR, which we had started. Um, and so I said, here are our plans. And I said, well, but by the way, this is the biggest challenge, in my opinion, facing education today. What's your association doing about the teacher shortage? And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, we could be adversaries or we could work together. I'd like to work together. And so she said, what do you think we can do? I said, well, I don't know about you, but if, if you paid for my textbooks, I probably would join your association. We're not gonna hard sell anybody, but we already have it in the budget, but if you wanna take on the textbooks, feel free, and then you're associated with the piece. Well, when I talked to their board, they had many questions, and then when I talked 
to the candidates or the, the association at large. Uh, they, they, they were going to vote on it, and many of them were in favor of it. And they said, but you know, we don't want to just pay for their textbooks. We want to help them get through. So when we talk about the college support we provide, understand the association is paying for part of their textbooks, but they're providing the tutoring in the afternoons for their college classes. So it is truly a partnership. So what could have been a real adversarial relationship through dialogue, communication, and challenging each other turned into a very positive situation. Of course, our principals had to understand what we were trying to do. This was out of the box thinking for many of them, um, especially when we talk about our waiver and reducing some of the teachers that would be hired in their buildings. Um, teachers needed to understand it, especially those teachers that provide the support within the classroom, and then the teaching body at whole, uh, as a whole, the association needed to understand that waiver and ask many questions, and we adjusted some of what we did based on their input. And then, of course, the candidates need to know what they're getting into. And it's tough to paint a picture of what they're getting into when you haven't, when you haven't done it yet, right? And so every year we get better at that. National teacher residency was very important to us, continues to be important to us, because they stress the fidelity of the residency program. They're not used as a, a sub. They're not used for car duty. They, have, they are teaching side by side or co-planning or co-intervening. And that's what makes an excellent resident with an excellent teacher. At this time, I want to really share with you the wraparound support that we're providing um, our teacher residents within the classroom. And Dr. Mason Bellamy is going to join us to, to explain opportunity culture and how we took another piece of research and applied it to Grow Your Own. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, I'm going to start with, before I jump into the equity gap, I'm going to start with a, a shout out to Dr. Satterfield from uh, sitting to my left over here. There's something he said in a, in a group I was in a few years ago that stuck with me and that I kind of brought when I first learned about public impacts work. And that was he said, we do things uh, three ways in our county. We do it, we do it right, and we do it right now. Um, am I getting that correct, Director Satterfield? Um, and so that, that, that stuck with me and that really framed how I like to do things as a principal. And so I started looking at um, some research by Public Impact and I was working on what they call the opportunity culture. And if you're not familiar with it, familiarize yourself with it. Um, because not only is um, grow your own excellent for what research tells us the most, the most, uh, the strongest variable in the class or in the student achievement is that teacher in front of the room, right? So when we have a teacher shortage, we know then we're going to have a student achievement problem we're gonna have issues that stem from a teacher shortage, right? And so not only can Grow Your Own fix that, but I think if you, if you attack the problem correctly, um, that world can collide with some other problems. We have some issues in equity in education and that you can get after two or three different problems that you're working on, all while creating teachers that are better prepared to do the job. And so that research led me to what we coin around here, the equity gap. You're not gonna find that in research anywhere. That's just something that, that's a, that's a branding I threw on it in, in the presentations I was doing around here. And we just use that as, as our way of saying that the bottom line is some of our neediest students are taught by teachers who are not prepared to teach them. Um, whether they're brand new teachers coming right out of college or whether they're more veteran teachers that have spent several years in the classroom, there's a gap between the needs of those students and the abilities um, or the preparedness of the, of the faculty in front of them. So that was the problem I was setting out to tackle, was really funneling my best teachers and are um, getting our candidates prepared to step into our highest needs school. And that's where I found public impact in the opportunity culture. Um, so if you've heard us talk through this before, there's three different, uh, three different roles that we frame around. And um, the one in the center there is what we call an MCL, is a multi-class leader. That's a person who's teaching about 40 to 50% of the day. And the other 50% of the day, they're investing in their colleagues. They're investing in teachers and in growing teachers. How do they do that? They do that with those residents um, so you have their team teachers, those folks to the side there, and then you have the residents down here. And so rather than having a traditional team of maybe four teachers that work with 80 second graders, we have a team of probably three teachers and two residents um, and an MCL. We, we've actually increased adult ratios. You've got a team of five, six, sometimes seven people doing the job of what four people were doing. And so you've taken stu students that may have greater needs, greater academic gaps, 
Um, you've given them an MCL, which is the best of the best. It's a five-level teacher, but not just someone who has a five on their team evaluation. It's the five level of the five level. We're looking at the top 5% of our district. We're not just looking at you having strong effect scores and being a five. We're looking for a teacher leader. Teacher leader pathway, something that, that sticks out in research now that we talk a lot about, keeping our best and brightest teachers in the classroom where they can make the biggest impact versus incentivizing them like we have in the past to take admin jobs they may or may not want, but they see as a next step they're being forced into. I see some heads nodding at me, so I know I'm getting at some problems that you see in your district as well. Um, and so we wanted to create a role, and that's what Public Impact has defined with the MCL work, as keeping our best teachers in the classroom, where frankly a lot of them wanted to stay to begin with. They want to be with their kids. So they're getting to do that, they're getting to invest in their kids, but they're also investing in the other 60 kids in their grade level that they may not have seen before. So um, the, the back part of their day or, or different parts of their day are spent investing in those team teachers that might be in their second or third or fourth year and need some support that you or I as a teacher probably never got outside of mentoring conversations that happened out outside of the day. Um, and then they also have these teacher residents that are going to school at night, that are working full time, paid as, as educational assistants, um, and working under that MCL for three years. Now imagine your student teaching experience, and rather than six weeks in two different placements, imagine you spent three years with the best teacher you can think of. Think of the best teacher that, that's in your district right now, and imagine you got to spend three years walking in that person's shadow and learning from them everything they do. Would that have made a difference in your first year as far as how prepared you were to meet the needs of your kids? That's our, that's our hope, right? That's our goal. So now I hope you can start to see where through providing that support of that MCL, Dr. Imperi just told you I was going to talk about support of these people in the de during the day. That's the support. That MCL and those team teachers are constantly there. Again, the, these people aren't just left to fend for themselves so our MCL can, can have free release time to go talk to people about planning. These people are working constantly with a team teacher or with an MCL all day, every day for three years. While we're at it, I'd also tell you that the research is pretty clear. You can improve student outcomes with this model. Um, and public impacts research is, is very clear on that. Um, but some other opportunities, things it does for us that we're very excited about. In our current structure, you can really be a teacher or an administrator. We want to create opportunities. That's why it's called the opportunity culture, not just for our kids, but for our employees as well. So we've created really different job pathways that didn't used to exist. So now you can start as a teacher resident with us. You can become a teacher and work in any of our schools, even the ones that don't have an opportunity culture model. You can become a team teacher in one of these schools and work with an MCL and think, I want a little bit more support my first two or three years in the classroom. And I want that MCL coming into my classroom for an hour a day, every day. Um, for the first few years that, I, that I'm here. Um, you can be an MCL. You can see that as your pathway, that I want to invest in other adults that then invest in students. I want to invest in students through investing in other adults as well and sharing my expertise. And then you can still become an administrator. We also have academic coach roles in our district that are kind of a horizontal line out to the side that don't necessarily fit that pattern but do fit as, as different roles we have. So we were excited about the different opportunities this can create for our existing staff as well. And we do, do believe that it will attract teachers sooner or later to our district because they see these as roles that don't exist everywhere. Um, these are opportunities that, that don't exist um, in, in all facets of education. So many people still have, you can be a teacher or you can be an administrator. Those are your choices, right? And I believe, I don't know how you quantify it, but I do believe that there are teachers that, um, that burn out, so to speak, because they don't want to be an administrator and they know that, but they also know they want something a little different than being in the classroom for 30 straight years. And right now, that, there's nothing else. There's nothing else that exists for those people unless they, they can get a district job, maybe as a consulting teacher, and those jobs are few and far between, right? Um, so I do believe there's going to be some benefits to that down the road too. And I mentioned the research from Public Impact. I'm not going to go in depth here with you. It's, it's all there for you at the click of a button if you go to Public Impact's website. But their early returns out of big districts like Charlotte Mecklenburg are very clear that teachers who are teaching in this type of atmosphere are showing better growth in their students and in their own personal effect scores. And like we said when I first started, what's the, the primary variable for student achievement? It's the teacher in the classroom. If we're improving teachers, we're improving outcomes for students, right? And so is this a surprise to you if you worked under an MCL for two or three years that your results and your student results would be better? And in particular, if we focus on the, the at-risk areas, the neediest schools in our district, we can close gaps for students that traditionally we've not been successful closing gaps for. We've thrown a lot of title money over the years. And when I say we, I mean everybody in this room, everybody in education. We've spent billions of dollars across this country in title money, and we've not really budged the needle on that gap yet, have we? 
If we have, I'm not sure what they're using the money for. I'd like to know because if it's just, if it's just a matter of reassigning that money somewhere, I'd like to do that. But as far as I'm aware, we've spent a lot of money do, using title money for class size reductions and things like that that come in waves, the pendulum swings, but I'm not sure we've moved the needle. Um, but uh, public impact showing that there's some needle movement in this scenario and it's happening. So this is kind of where the worlds collide of supporting those teachers in those environments in Grow Your Own and creating that. And hopefully, and this one's Dr. Barron, where you at? At the end of the day, um, there's a, a little, they give me a hard time. I've tried to not say at the end of the day a lot. It turns out I say at the end of the day when I present a lot. So that was for Dr. Barron, just for her. But at the end of the day, three years from now, we should have 40, 60, 80 teachers coming out that have been educated by our best and brightest teachers for three straight years, equipped to do the job, to stand in front of the kids that need them most and be prepared to do that. Um, so that's a little bit about their supports here. And I could go on for days about opportunity culture. I'll be around at the end if you have any other questions or resources about that. But my last challenge to you is don't just think I'm growing teachers. Think about how you can use the structures of this to grow teachers and get after other inequities in education right now. Um, and then I'll, I'd love to talk to anyone about it after that. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Imperatrice. Thank you, Dr. Bellamy. And so uh, around the class size waiver, and again, uh, we did a presentation on this November 6th. If you have more questions when we're done, be happy to, to answer it. But, but we had to have some talking points around class size waiver. Okay, so we're using existing money to fund $2,010,000 of existing pipeline or new pipeline. And so the fact that the association was involved in it, it's a positive thing. The, the fact that you're reinvesting that money into your own community um, is positive. The fact that residencies, when you study residencies after not three years, 93% stay in the profession as opposed to traditional student teaching placements, where after three years, three to five years, 50% stay in the profession, it's money well spent. So there's a list there of, of our talking points, but we certainly had to have everybody on board around the waiver. So other district challenges, we talked about the budget impact the first year, how we're using existing money for the expansion, potential grants to support. So we have a, a wonderful grant department here, gets 15 to $16 million worth of grants a year. So she has certainly been focused on opportunities to um, find federal money. In fact, the NEA has presented a $250,000 grant that would pay for all the textbooks, that would pay for all the tutoring, um, that would pay for praxis support and, and things like that. And then we think by Christmas, we just talked to Workforce Essential, Austin P is a sponsor, um, and the U.S. Department of Labor that we're going to be certified as an apprenticeship. That's huge. With that, not only comes recognition, but funding. You think of who our governor is right now and where his focus is, and you think federally where the focus is, you become an apprenticeship, and this is truly an apprenticeship. What makes it an apprenticeship is you're growing them into a profession, right? That wraparound support of opportunity culture is one piece, but you can't leave them alone in their university classes. And that, that's a real big piece of what we want to talk to um, after uh, Dr. Mason talks about the non-negotiables. You've heard Dr. Imperatrice talk uh, several times about class size waivers. So I want to talk a little bit about what that looks like if you're on the school district side and you're interested in pursuing a class size waiver. Uh, I'm just going to hit the high points, but when uh, Clarksville reached out and asked for the uh, commissioner's waiver to increase their class sizes above the class size average, there were some expectations around under what conditions that would happen and some assurances we wanted from Clarksville. So number one, we wanted candidates to be in a dual certified program, making sure that they had a multitude of options when they finished. And we wanted them to complete their program at no cost to them. And I think you heard some of that earlier today on how Clarksville and Austin P worked together uh, to make sure that, that they were able to do this at no cost to the candidates. Um, 
we wanted them to be in a paid multi-year residency. So people who are working in those positions, um, we know that student teaching oftentimes is a barrier to finishing school. So we wanted them in a paid residency, and as you heard, Clarksville has put them to work as classroom assistants. Um, we wanted them to be in classrooms with highly effective teachers. It makes sense that if you're building the future of your teaching force, to have them learn from the habits of your very best teachers. And we wanted to make sure that they received quality academic supports. If you think about the adults in this scenario, you're taking people who've been out of school for a large number of years, or people who might have tried school a long time ago and weren't successful. They're going to need help and support to get through the program. Some other questions um, that we were gonna ask. Number one, there had to be a guarantee that we wouldn't go above the class size maximum. There's a difference between the class size average and the class size maximum. There is no waiver for a class size maximum. That's a hard cap. Um, but then we had to have some assurances that the money that was being saved by increasing class sizes was then being re reinvested um, in a grow your own program and being directly used to support growing more teachers. So if you're interested in a class size waiver, I can talk more about that toward the end. Um, I'm gonna kick it back to Clarksville, um, but I'll be glad to talk to you about class size waiver th is, if this is a direction you're interested in pursuing. One of the key pieces um, about that class size waiver too is that basically a teacher pays for two residents or educational assistants. So in most cases, your adult to student ratio is going down. Your teacher to student ratio isn't going down, but your adult to student ratio is going down. So let me talk to you about the academic and mentoring support at the college level. So um, I don't know how many of you have heard of AVID, but AVID has over 30 years of technical expertise, K-12 and higher ed, in the areas of taking first generation ethnically diverse students and providing um, more advanced classes so that they could get into college and then once they're in college to provide with them the wraparound support that's necessary for them to be successful as first generation college students. National Teacher Residence does a great job in their classes embedding all that together. They use our scope and sequence, it's all aligned, they practice, they talk about equity, they mentor, um, they find out what's going on with people and they do that within their context. When you deal with a university, there's more than one entity there or a college, so you have to provide some level of expertise. And the level of expertise that AVID provides is they know where first generation college students have their most difficulty. They have it in focused note taking, they have it in critical reading, they have it in structured writing, they, have, they need inquiry based tutoring, they need success skill opportunities like time management um, and goal setting and keeping those goals in front of them. So Dr. Roz Evans in the back is from AVID so if you have any questions about that level of support, then I encourage you to see Dr. Evans some point during this time. But I'm gonna hand it over just, just for a moment to Dr. Phys Phyllis Casebolt and her team. So one of the things we did with the waiver is when we studied Fresno State and Fresno Unified, the way they were able to pull this off is they had pipeline facilitators that help with uh, the information sessions, the recruitment, um, the interviews, uh, work beside the college with the selection process, um, once they're in their residency with fidelity checks, and the after-school AVID support. Okay, so I want to bring this home to you because I'm very passionate about this. Do not bring people into a college setting because you can with a waiver and you can get existing money as a district and then not be responsible for them as a district to help with that wraparound support. That's just not fair, okay? They have challenges. And so I want those challenges to become real to you. Thank you. So I wanted to share and just back that up that AVID provides structures that help us stay focused during tutoring sessions. 
but the wraparound support is constant. Um, we've had teacher residents that, that have had some very difficult life circumstances. Some have lived in their car. I'm gonna tear up a little bit, I'm sorry. Some have lived in their cars for a few days because of circumstances beyond, uh, beyond their control. Some also had challenges with childcare. And they were saying, well, we can't come to this session because we don't have anyone to watch our children. And there were a lot of barriers. And our job is to eliminate barriers because we want them to succeed and persevere through this program. And I'll tell you, because of the relationship that I have with my co-parent, Dr. Brewster, back there, I called her and I said, look, I've realized that we need to have child care support during these tutoring sessions. Is there a place where we could provide that? And she's like, absolutely. I mean, there was no, like, let me call you back in a couple of days because she understood the urgency and she made it happen. And then another phone call with the association president to say, do you have any people that would be willing to serve to provide childcare? And she said, absolutely. So they're getting compensated $16 an hour to provide childcare during the one hour tutoring sessions for each class. And that's absolutely beyond belief and you will not believe the return on that investment they are so thankful that they can bring their children there. They know they're cared for, they know they're supported, and they appreciate that little tiny thing that seems so minor to some of us, to them it means the world. Um, we also have realized that there are some learning gaps for some of the residents. Maybe they have not been in a class for 20 years and they don't remember what it means to study. So when they go and read something, they start highlighting everything. They have difficulty picking out the most important parts of a section that they're reading. And they take copious notes, but they don't understand to prioritize those notes. So we provide individualized support for them. We pull out, Dr. Imperatrice had one of our special populations teachers who's phenomenal at providing support to work with a couple of the teacher residents truly struggling to help them with foundation and understanding of what they need to do to be prepared as students. We also um, arrange tutoring experts with the association. So for like our math session, we have a high school, a middle school, an elementary school math teacher in the sessions to provide supports as well as the, uh, one of our career consulting teachers to help provide that direct instruction as needed and then tutoring support for the classes. We have small group. When we see someone's really, really struggling, we'll pull them and have them come for um, some sessions with us with very focused, intense, involved sessions. And Dr. Bellamy joked the other day because one of the teacher residents, and this was not during a planned session, but he brought his baby with him. And Tracy and Levita are, are, Levita are part of our team. And um, Tracy hasn't changed a diaper in a while, but she did that day. And he said, that puts new meaning to the term wraparound support, right? <laughs> So it is so true. It takes the, everybody rolling up their sleeves and realizing this is an investment for our community. We are investing in people. And there are some that are straggling and we've had to talk to them like we're their mamas. And we have done it. Tracy and Levita did it on Friday. Went out, I said, I need y'all to go to school and talk to, and they did. They talked to them very directly. So it's really, really, beneficial to have a team to wrap around support. And I talk to Benita every day, or, or text her or something. And the team that we have and the relationship we have with Austin P and the association, it's all of us coming together and realizing we're on, we have a vision, we want top quality educators, and we're invested in this all together. So we also had one other thing that is very important. We had our general counsel create an agreement for FERPA so that we could have a signed agreement from the teacher residents that we can have access to their grades. 
and you will need that, and Austin P approved that through their legal department as well, that we can have access to student grades. And they've agreed to it. They understand that we're all in this together and that we have to know how they're doing academically. Thank you, Dr. Casebold. I just, if you go into this, I want you to go into it with open eyes, that we are investing in our community, and they have met the college requirements, but that doesn't mean college is ready for them sometimes. So then we have to adjust and work with our college partners and work with our association partners and work with our district. What I will tell you is, you know, we're a pretty good sized district. If we can't provide very comprehensive support with all the resources we have in this district, who can? Right? But it's about aligning resources and being willing to align those resources. So at this time, I believe Dr. Mason you know, lead a planning session. Questions right now. Okay. All right. We've thrown a lot at you this afternoon, and you're bound to have questions. I can't imagine another time that we're going to have district folks, EPP folks, state folks, and experienced people who've done the work, AVID, everybody who's touched this in some way is represented in here. We've got residencies with Nashville Teacher Residency. If you have a question, now is the time to ask it. I'm going to bring you the microphone. Thank you. Um, Alfred Hall from University of Memphis. Um, one of the areas that we were trying to explore is with the waiver request. Part of the conditions were students have to, tuition support must also be provided in addition to support with them working as an educational assistant in the classroom. Can the partners here talk about how they're managing that or the supports to fund both? Okay, so I guess I would go to probably Dr. Chandler and Dr. Imperatrice. So that was my question too when this first started. Um, the short of it is that our provost and president have signed off on this huge financial commitment. Uh, when I first started the job, I asked our president and provost rather forwardly, were we just, were we just gonna run programs or, we, or, or were we gonna try to fix some problems? And when I brought this up to them, I reminded them that I asked them that question. Um, our, our enrollment, like a lot of places, uh, has, is declining over the past five years, although we're on an uptick. And so we have the same number of faculty now than we had six, seven years ago when our enrollment was a little more. And the short of the answer uh, in terms of resources is that we're just absorbing these students, um, which is the, the provost office frames it as uh, half, you know, splitting the cost 50 50. But we're really getting, you know, half and the other part we're just absorbing. Um, when this first started, I basically took our, our, to our lowest tuition rate, because we have a rate on main campus and we have a rate at Fort Campbell. So that's, that's the, when I started running the numbers, I used the Fort Campbell rate. Uh, then I took away all of the fees and then I took out a course to try to get the cost down as much as possible and then just divided by two. And so that's what the district owed, quote unquote owed, and that's what the, the College of Ed owed. It winds up being less than that for the, for the district because of the financial aid that they receive. Um, but from the college standpoint, it's figuring out like what the big price tag is gonna be and then arguing with people above the dean level uh, if that's something they're willing to absorb. Curtis, can you talk about the financial aid they receive? Dr. Brewster, you wanna talk about that? Dr. Brewster is the miracle worker when it comes to financial aid. Well, I talk to them often, at least once a week, financial aid, because we've got students in this first cohort of 40 that are in many different places. We've got some veterans who have full VA benefits who may choose to use them or not use them, depending on their financial personal situation. We have a gentleman who is in the guard who also gets supplements. Um, we have a lot of Tennessee Promise students who have the promise as long as they keep their grades, so that comes off the top. So any students who choose to 
use the Promise and use their VA or any other scholarships, that comes off the top of that particular student and then it gets divided. But if students choose not to take out financial aid, which most of them have not, they don't, but they have filled out the FAFSA. They can take aid if they need it for personal reasons, but most of them have not chosen to do that. So every student literally is an individual kind of picture of where they are and what they need. And then from a district standpoint, uh, so really, you know, it's all about competition. And so when, when we were working with NTR, I knew what it would cost as a whole to get somebody complete. So I factored that same amount into where our line was with Austin P. And when we eventually got there is when we got there and did the same thing for Lipscomb. And so we're looking at completers, so that looks different in a three-year program as far as funds go than it does in a one-year program. Uh, like we said before, we put over a hundred thousand, or over a million dollars, excuse me, into our first pipeline with ELTR. We got the class size waiver, which equated to two million uh, ten thousand dollars. But from from my perspective, with financial aid, we've had we've had to make some adjustments too, because one of our one of our ELTRs lost their Hope Scholarship, and we didn't know it. Their last during finals week. They just bombed some finals. They lost their Hope Scholarship. So she was dedicated at the time to continue her education. So we had an MOU with Austin P that said we would pay 50%, but I couldn't incur the 50% of the hope that she lost on Austin P. So we set up a payment plan for her since she was working. And she paid what she lost if she wanted to do that. Now we have some that may fail a class. If they fail a class, then they're gonna incur the cost of that class to make it up. They're working for us. So we can do payment plans if they don't meet the agreement that was stated in the MOU. That's a real life learning experience, right? I don't think any of us didn't have some bumps in the road somewhere along the way in life that cost us financially, but when it comes out of our pocket, it becomes very real, right? And so sometimes it's going to become very real. Did I answer your question? Thank you. I can't be the only question. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to add that as a private institution, we do the same thing that you discussed with Austin P. So you have an opportunity to work with your upper administration and to say, here is this opportunity, here's the right thing to do, let's get involved in this work. And yes, the bottom line becomes much different for you at that point than it would with someone who pays, you know, what, what your listed tuition price is. Frankly, very few pay our listed tuition price anyway. But, um, you know, we, we do really work with districts and partnerships. And Randall can talk to that, speak to that. Sean can speak to that. So I think it's just a matter of getting in there with your business office, whoever your financial officers are, and having those discussions about your mission and what you're supposed to be doing and how the university as a whole can be a good partner in the community. And, and just, just to be just up front, the, the supply isn't meeting the demand. So to think that peop, universities or other EPPs are going to continue to be able to exist the way they exist now is an error in thinking. Something's got to change. So you can be part of that change or you can sit down and resist it but you're gonna find yourself out of the game, I think, if you sit down and resist it. I'm just being perfectly honest. What other questions are there? Let me get my steps in today.
Thanks. So you've rolled this out to the directors of schools across the state, right? You've rolled it out to us. Have you thought about rolling it out to upper administration at our respective institutions? I'm looking to Michael. <laughs> <laughs> conversations just a few years ago looking at data, it's a great idea. Um, I think it would take other stakeholders to be engaged in it, TBR, uh, not TBR, sorry, THEC, uh, too many acronyms in our world, um, State Board, but uh, we haven't had any formal conversations about that. What are you thinking would be the lever there for change? Yeah. Than any other meeting we've ever had with leadership. Yeah, good yeah. point. Well, thank you for that point. Thanks. Am I the only provost here? Are there any other VPs? Or? I'm the provost of the VP at Carson Newman University. I'm just curious if there are any others here. I did get dragged here by my dean, so. <laughs> but I would, I would second that. I think it's, it's an issue. I'm just seconding your point. It would be a great way to move it because we don't really know until our deans tell us what's going on. So we might have heard about teacher shortages in the news. We don't see the pipeline. We don't see what some of the responses are. But you are talking about significant all allocation of resources, people, time. You're talking about coordination across multiple offices across campus, financial aid, registrar's office. So this takes a lot of time and momentum. And oftentimes it will help. So I think if there's a way that maybe we can facilitate some conversations, that, that would probably be helpful. Where are you pointing? Was there a question over here? Now we've broken the ice. We're, we're teaming up on you to make sure we're asking questions from across the room so you get your steps in. Um, for the Austin P folks, did you already have a dual certification program of study set up? Because you're required to do a dual certification right in order to get the waiver. So that was something you created to start this. Well, we, so they're not doing student teaching hours. So that's 12 hours that's in our undergrad program. So that freed up 12 hours that we were able to put special ed courses in so that they still have 120 hours. So that's how that ended up being. We, we don't have like a dual certification program, but, but that's how they were able. So we have to be careful how we freight. We say it's dual certification. It's it's still a K-5 program, but they're getting special ed courses that will enable them to take the praxis after they receive their initial license to get, I'm saying this because Michael Durline's in the room. So, <laughs> so, I, do, <laughs> so I just want to be clear, it's you know, on the books, it's, a K, it's still our K-5 program, but they're getting special ed courses and they'll be able to take um, the praxis afterwards. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, Lisa, you can't add on to a K-5 license. So they get their initial license in K-5. They've had some sped courses, so is that the provisional license? Is that what you're doing? It's what? It's a recommendation for additional endorsement plus test. They can't add it by test only, but Austin can recommend for an additional endorsement plus the test. With just that minimum number of courses. That, so that's a error. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, additional endorsements have always been interesting. I will also say uh, from a program approval standpoint, because I know this question is going to come up, right? Um, we have been dealing with these kind of on a case-by-case -case basis because it can be any number of different things, right? It could be a combination of two programs that are already approved. 
It could be a truncating of an existing dual endorsement program. It could be a brand new program where the provider doesn't offer these endorsements to start. Um, <clears throat> so what we've tried to do, because in the past we've had very squishy definitions around uh, minor and major modifications to a program. So we're trying to get better at using our specialty area program review template and just defining exactly which portions you have to complete based on what is happening in your program design. Does that make sense? So if it's a major revision to clinical practice, you would have to focus on that area. If coursework is essentially the same, you would be exempt from completing that part of the SAP proposal template. Is this in writing? Do you want to complete more SAT proposal templates? <laughs> um, no, it's not. We can put it in writing. I, I think it'd be clear, clear if we had directions. Yes, sure. So we're basically exempting you from parts of the SAT proposal because you're just taking what you've already done, what's already been approved, and modifying it. Does that make sense? Bobby's skeptical. Kim. entire program of study for elementary ed at Austin P and if they take our additional hours at Austin P in special ed we are familiar with what they have taken we know their clinical experience yada 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 we feel good about now also recommending them for a licensure in special ed right so didn't want to put words in your mouth so what what Martin used to say is you look at every person's particular situation. You look at their transcript, you look at their professional experience, you look at the whole package, and if you at MTSU feel good about recommending them for licensure and special ed in addition to whatever else they've had, then you can recommend. So I, I hear that's what they're doing, yeah. that, that's what we're doing at Carson Newman. Let me add to that really quickly. <clears throat> I love how you just channeled Martin, by the way. That was good. I talked to him last week. Um, essentially, additional endorsement programs do not have to be approved because you are basing your recommendation off of the person in front of you. The experience, you have to have the, the program approved to start. You have to have an initially approved program. But your recommendation for additional endorsement is based off that person in front of you. In this case, you know a lot about these people in front of you, right? You should be able to factor in not only coursework that they've taken, but also experiences they've had in the classroom um, into your decision as to whether you believe they, they should be recommended for additional endorsement. Julie? No, you're good. Okay. <laughs> so when they're recommended for licensure, what type of clinical practice is selected and when are they recommended for licensure? And we have a dual initial program that is a true du dual in K-5 and ESL, but if we were um, if we could count our add-ons for our report card, I think that would give a lot of momentum to programs for high need additional endorsements. So that's two questions and a statement. <laughs> that's fine. Um, clinical practice type, great question. So these have all been, any residency program really falls under the internship model because that's in writing. It's a full year in a lot of these cases is way more than a full year. I would heavily advocate for us to get something in writing about what a true residency program is. Um, and I think we need a very clear definition of that in state board policy. I don't wanna do that haphazardly because um, I think what we want is much like we've done in the past with the Educator Preparation Working Group, EPWG, any recommendations we make to policy um, are really driven by the field. And so what I want to make sure of is that any, any uh, very clear requirements we put on a residency program are not barriers, but are also driven by research. Your second question was one actually for the state board, I would say, but um, heard you definitely uh, understand the need to look at things like additional endorsements for um, high needs endorsement areas, because we've got a lot of folks that are coming out of additional endorsement programs going into high needs areas. So 
Jack, anything you'd add on that? Great. <laughs> Program. Just at the very end. It's yeah, correct. At the it's not a job embedded program. Yeah, at the end of three years. Yeah. Any other questions? Any more questions for anyone but Michael? Or even Michael. We can go back to him. If you work in a school district, everything they were talking about confuses me too. <laughs> All right, so the way we envision the rest of this afternoon going looks something like this. You have some more questions to guide you, the last section of the partnership tool. You have a timeline on that thick cardstock paper where Clarksville has basically laid out every step they took or the major steps they took to get to their partnership. And what I would love for you to have when you leave here today is an idea of what your next steps are. If this is, if this is a direction you want to head, let's think about what's the next thing you can do. You won't have a plan when you leave here today. You won't have a, you know, a perfect action plan where you have everything written out. But we do want you to know the direction you want to head, that you want to head when you walk out the door. So um, you, we've got some time built into the schedule from now until 4.30. Um, you have the experts in the room. Let's take advantage of those resources as you start thinking about what this looks like in your area and how you can work in your context to move toward a Grow Your Own program. So I'm going to turn the microphone off. And then if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll try to get the right person to you um, if you run into a, an obstacle and you need to talk it through with someone who's done the work. Any questions before we get started? All right, I'll leave it to you and your planning. 